So welcome everybody. This is the 19th uh, GRC Supper Club. We'll be at the fourth virtual one. And when we did the trilogy, the COVID trilogy last, I think it was this time last year, um, I think none of us expected to go into a fourth virtual event. And I'm hoping this will be the last one before we actually go into face-to-face -face meetings again and live dinners. So we'll keep our fingers crossed there. Tonight is really about understanding if a combination of SOX Lite or SOX UK with combined assurance and self-demonstration will really help you reduce that regulatory pain or that continual regulatory change that you're seeing. So this is the final session when I wanted to bring in, um, it would have been three, it's actually two special guest stars onto the panel to, um, to join the esteemed group of speakers. We have Ian, Ian Ewart, um, who is, you know, ASIN, he was one of the founders at ASIN and now leads the, the climate risk and ESG side of, um, of ASIN. We've also got Drew, or um, Drew Paul, sorry, from um, CAPCO, who leads the regulatory change and reg tech side of um, CAPCO. So we're gonna ask a couple of questions to those two first, and then we'll open it out to the wider, the wider panel, if that's all right, to really feed off what was said before, and also just bounce off some of the questions that we've asked now, and hopefully it is gonna come through as, as we go through this as well. So um, one of the questions I had for Ian, really, first of all, um, it was Paul, but he's not there anymore, was uh, have we reached the tipping point regarding ESG? And it could have been you that mentioned the wobble point, actually, the other day. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is society ready to hold companies accountable and drive that change, that cultural shift? Um, so, you know, Paul made a, a number and several of reinforcing really important points that I think um, kind of reflect really what's been happening um, in, in society. So there are moments when corporate culture catches up with society, certain corporates set trends, society, societal trends just emerge. And I think this has been one of these kind of moments where we knew there was something brewing. Um, we felt very uncomfortable. And I think as the sort of levels of, uh, of um, discomfort arise uh, and, you know, people working in the city of London, people working in New York and, and same would have been true in Switzerland or HK or wherever. Um, going to work in financial services, you had to walk past uh, the climate um, uh, activists that were um, supposedly disrupting our lives. Um, but actually, I think people were kind of slowing down as they were walking past those demonstrations and, and thinking, ah, oh, yeah, you know, there's something here which which leaves me decidedly uncomfortable. And I think there was a, a bit of a societal moment there. Uh, and of course, you know, we were getting increasingly uncomfortable about that. And then we got blindsided and hit by COVID. Uh, and everybody was confined and everybody had to be at home. And then there's a whole series of, of themes and, and Paul has already enumerated a number of them. And, uh, you know, from plastic bags through to people thinking creatively around um, better solutions and a better way of living and then the the the, the sort of polar bears and ice caps bit being done by um, the beloved uh, David Attenborough um, sort of sets a whole tone and then actually we sort of come together and I don't know how human beings do this but we're we're pretty good at, at, at doing these things and we realize that we need to actually legislate and set some boundaries and set some rules for ourselves and we're in the process of that right now the regulation is coming you know cop 26 is is about that and what are we doing well we're, we're basically putting together a whole series of societal tendencies things which companies have been getting towards uh, and we're basically putting that together and distilling it uh, and as ever you know what gets measured gets done um, you know back to the points that sonia was making in terms of how uh, regulations get implemented and so on. You know, back to your looking glasses and looking through the binoculars going forward for this. Get the you know, prop out again. Yeah, get the prop out again. Yeah, we 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 do learn from the past, but um, we tend to need to go through this process each time. Uh, and I think that um, you know, a little bit like your wheel of fortune with the wheel of personalities there, and you know, how do we make this happen? Um, it needs it needs care and attention. Uh, uh, and I think this is one opportunity where we're actually really collectively giving ourselves the best chance to succeed. 
that, that's a great, great overview. Thank you very much. And we'll probably come back onto that in a, in a second yeah. as, as we link everything up, actually. But I, I, again, I wanted to just in, in, introduce Drew. I may have got your title wrong, Drew, so I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Well, you promoted me. That's perfectly fine. Well, oh, that's, that's, <laughs> oh, that, that's a good place to good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, we mentioned that we talked uh, the other day as well. And I just wanted to you know, introduce a, a, a quick question or two to yourself. Um, around how can you prove um, you know what you've done around regulations um, you know and, and how can you meet the new requirements to an acceptable level because me and you were talking about you know you're not going to meet every regulation perfectly right I'm a recovering perfectionist you know I've made that step at least away from being a perfectionist I'm a recovering perfectionist now but in terms of you know achieving what's needed or the baseline of those regulations how do you prove that you're doing that or how do you know that you're getting that baseline um, and, and achieving some success yeah, so so I think, I mean, from my kind of experience of this, I think it's exactly that. It's organizations have historically, um, you know, if you look back when sort of the reg landscape pretty much started with kind of Dodd-Frank, and I'm talking reg reporting here, um, it was very, you know, it's quite, uh, it was very prescriptive. It was, you know, a lot of black boxes. And what we've seen since then is that regulations gotten more complex, yet the systems and people and processes, oh, sorry, systems and processes that, work in that space have continued to sort of maintain the status quo. Um, and I think what we're seeing more and more is as organizations evolve and they sort of get a lot more, um, I guess they start to get a bit more sophisticated. What we're starting to see more, what I'm starting to see more and more is that there is, you know, people are sort of realizing that it's the burden of proof is probably the hardest part of regulation. And the way that we're seeing a lot of sort of sophisticated organizations meet this is through emerging um, reg regulatory technology pretty much, right? Because what you have is you have the ability to sort of, if you cover off the sort of horizon scanning piece, which um, Sonia sort of touched on, you have the ability to, you know, use tools to tell you what regulations coming down the pipe and what impact it has to your organization. As you go further down the stack, you have tools that enable you to basically assess how you're responding to a regulation, to what that tool would do to sort of make your assurance process is more effective. Um, so I think it's about, it's kind of about, you know, evolve, turning up the dial on the kind of technology use. Yeah. And more importantly, and I think this is where a lot of these organizations that we speak to on a weekly, ba you know, weekly, monthly basis are taking their lead is they're quickly realizing the regulators now have access to the same technology. So the regulator starts to spot that, you know, there's issues with what you're doing before you spot it. That to them is a real concern. So I think it's a case of, you know, as regulators start to use more, more technology and or supervisory technology, firms need to step up the game. And we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that the, the sell side is definitely doing it, but more importantly, weirdly, um, uh, you know, a sector which has generally been quite, I'd say, lackluster in their efforts to be, be, be compliant, the buy side is quickly starting to pick up. So, you know, you are seeing this across the board where, you know, firms are basically turning to technology, realizing that, you know, investing in their own systems isn't really, hasn't really paid off. And you still, you know, we've got organizations that spend 100 to, you know, 250 to like a billion dollars, pounds, Swiss francs, whatever currency it is, to meet where they are today and on a regular landscape. And if you look at the quality of the reporting, it doesn't justify that level of spend. Um, so I think it's that. And then there is a combination of sort of, you know, change fatigue is starting to set in right we're at i can't i mean i don't know son you've probably implemented them all but there's probably <laughs> we're on sort of 12 to 13 sort of large regulation now coming around the corner um and you're sat there going people are tired of this right front offices don't want to give you any more money to do this yeah. they're questioning why you continue to spend why the quality of data is still poor why you know you're still getting hit with fines when you shouldn't be so i think it's a case of it's not you know, going down that route you've always taken isn't going to work anymore. Um, and I think organizations are quickly starting to realize that that is sort of, that is the case and you've got to find better ways to do it. I'm not saying reg tech is the only way to do it, but it's no. one of the ones that has proven to be yeah, successful. That, that's a really good point. And, you know, most people on the call um, that know me or um, have been to the sessions before know that, la you know, the last seven years I've spent in the, the, the risk tech, GRC, IRM, whatever you want to call it, EGRC, um, and, you know, there's a load of rip and replace that happens every three or four years within that cycle of software. And the main reason for that, I believe, is the data, to your point, Drew, around, you know, quality of data that feeds those systems. It's, the systems pretty much do all the same things with a few nuances that may or may not meet your bespoke kind of ways of doing things in your um, FS and non-FS kind of industry. 
but it's ultimately the lack of data or the lack of investment in getting the right risk and control data um, that actually means that it's replaced every four years. So as the, the, you know, the technology improves and you know, the community kind of aspect comes in, to your point about the regulators dipping in as well, that doesn't have to be a negative approach. It could actually be welcome to say, we'll give you some desensitized information across the board. You dip in and see how your regulations are improving the foundations within the financial services industry, be it whatever you know, sector of that. Um, you've got you know, investment banking, you've got um, re uh, retail, in insurance, corporate finance, the rest of them, right? And then outside of NF as well. If they can dip in and see that information and see it's improving over time, they'll have more comfort that you know, their regulations are actually doing something. At the minute, I don't think they get that. And they just go around hitting people with sticks, <laughs> which is- I think, yeah. answer, right? I mean, I think, you know, your points around, you know, the only thing that's really different is the data is very true. So there's no competitive advantage in building your own reg engines and reporting engines. The same way, you know, the regulators are also, yeah, they're becoming uh, more sophisticated in terms of using supervisory technology, but they're also realizing, I mean, you know, I sit on a couple of Bank of England panels where they're sort of quickly realizing that, um, you know, you can't have this state where you have sort of non-machine readable regulation. So we're quickly starting to see regulators head in that direction. So it's only a matter of time before, you know, if you wait until the regulator moves to that point, then you're again behind the curve. So it's sort of, you may as well kind of get up to speed, realize there is zero competitive advantage in reg reporting um, or actually compliance generally. Um, apart from, of course, if you get it wrong, then there's definitely disadvantages and sort of get on that train before, you know, everybody jumps on and, you know, basically don't wait until everybody else is on it which a lot of firms like to do today. no that is a really good point and, and at that point i'll probably open it out to you know to sonia to suzanne and and to paul but in terms of you know um one of the questions that came in was about what can you use that you've already done so you know i i've always talked about um, test wants comply many you know that's always been really difficult to do because no one knows what controls hit what regs and what's part of that regs or if there's two controls doing the same thing across one reg all those kind of approaches so um i don't know who wants to answer that one but you know how do you see that we can leverage some things that are already done is that one maybe for sonia do you think or suzanne yeah i'm happy to start off and suzanne you can you obviously have got rich experience in this um you know i um certainly what i've seen over a number of organizations including um bny mellon is that we uh we do traceability we do um rec mapping you know absolutely making sure that you it's one to many right so you can't there's no luxury i mean i mentioned the pace of change um i mentioned the the pressure on implementation and sustaining and evidencing it it, it i I don't know how you do it with, uh, without the enabling tools, actually. Brilliant. Exactly, Sonia. We, we've really tried to focus on, I, I think I mentioned the sort of buy versus build debate. And, and as Drew said, there are tools in the market that are far more sophisticated than anything we could build internally, not because we're not capable, but because that, that AI is really valuable. And, and if a firm has, has perfected it, then it makes a lot more sense for us to buy it in and apply it to our architecture than to try to replicate it. And, and it also provides a little bit of air cover because there are certain um, tools that the regulators have become quite familiar with. So if we say we're using them, it gives us a little bit of additional credence. You know, again, we might not always get it right, but we're trying, we're trying hard and we're trying to really adapt and, and be nimble and, and utilize what's out there to get the best results, so. No, I think that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, I've seen it in, you know, I've been involved in section 166 reviews from a technology perspective in my old role and also from a consultancy perspective as well. And just seeing the, the um, proactiveness, Suzanne, to your point, but if you've got section 66, 166 as well, uh, that usually says to use some technology to automate some part of the processes if it's an antiquated business. Mm -hmm. But if you're providing proactive um incentive to or not incentive it's the wrong word but you're being seen to be proactive by the regulators that can only be a good thing uh, I agree yeah I mean good. yeah because because again like we're not always going to get it right but but you do sort of you don't get points for trying it's not um you know third grade baseball sorry <laughs> that, that's an American reference but <laughs> no, um <laughs> but um but there there is a sort of you know particularly if you read through some of the enforcement actions the FCA is, has issued in the CFTC as well 
um, there is um, mitigating credit given for efforts made to comply um, and a recognition in, in the event that you do somehow end up in a proper enforcement action, um, their penalty model is even in contingent on um, credit for having proper processes in place and, and, and if you still manage to have an issue, they recognize that that is, is mitigated or um, what's the word I'm looking for, ameliorated by, um, by the effort to comply and, and, and by trying to engage in continuous improvement to, to do it better each time. So um, we take some, some comfort in that, but um, ultimately- No, but I like the analogy, the baseball analogy. It's, it's a global <laughs> supper club, you see, or, although it's a lunch club in the States. Right. On the East Coast at the minute. Yeah. But, but in terms of, you know, you don't want to get to the stage where you're being hit with a section 166 or, or any kind of um, a situation like that. But, you know, the transitioning away from that um, consultancy or that chosen one to the list of people that can do it, isn't there? To um, transition away usually involves leaving behind some kind of technology or some kind mm -hmm. of automation, some kind of improvement in the, the processes and, and risks and controls, which is really good. And I've just seen, actually, a really good question come in that uh, Drew, I think, have you, you, have you taken this question? Are you there, Drew? I didn't. I didn't expect to take the question, but I can answer. I oh no! Be... It just says. It says Drew would like to answer this question. I know. Live. I know. I know. So I, I go for it. it. Anyway. I'll, I'll, so, I'll so, so I do have a view, though. I mean, so, you want me so to my... you want me to state what it is first, because a lot is a long one. I'll try and do it quickly. It's from Mark Leopold, who oh, I know really well. He's based in the, um, in Holland, actually, uh, Netherlands. Sorry. So societal developments slash expectations are indeed likely to drive regulation. Regulation, however, is still merely an external driver for companies. It could be argued that regulations are relevant to create a level playing field, but fall short of making material changes in ESG and other areas. That is likely to only come from an internal drive, i.e. compliance versus self-motivation. Has the panel any thoughts? I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> Do you want me to start, and then you can, you know, yeah, you can go, for it. go for it, go for it, Sonia. Um, I, um, you know, the focus that the FCA in recent um, years have had on a purpose, and how that actually underpins culture, value, behaviors, and outcomes. I think that is the right approach, and that is sort of in line with what this question was, right? And, and, and I agree, um, you know, I, I, if you get the underlying purpose right and people do the right thing, it's much more effective than having all these, uh, you know, millions and millions of rules to try and implement, implement stuff. But that's just, you know, we have been going on a journey um, and I think many others in the financial services industry, I, um, you know, participate in many of the industry bodies that's really been focusing on how do we do the underlying, how do we make, and that purpose is not just the purpose to, you know, for your shareholders, it is your purpose for your, for in society as well. And how do you actually link that, 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 that an organization can really see its values go with a purpose and that drives the behaviors that you work with. Sorry, I stole your thunder there, Drew. No, no, that's fine. I mean, I, I was going to sort of answer that internal versus external driver sort of component in the question. So, my view on this is that, yeah, so I agree the regulation sort of tries to get firms to a level playing field. But I think if you gave an organization the option to, you know, be compliant, right, I think there'd be very few out there that chose to go down that route. So I think actually the majority of sort of um, drivers are external. So, you know, if you look at recent examples, you know, it's, it's sort of reputational damage um, by you know, for, for whatever reason, any sort of regulatory failing has massive implications for any organization. Um, and that generally comes from the kind of people that, you know, you know, are sort of make up the bulk of bulk clients within these organizations, um, especially when you look at kind of global markets. Um, and then the second thing, which I, which I read, I'm going to say last week, maybe this earlier this week was, you know, you now have firms like Berkshire Hathaway being asked by their shareholders as to what the hell they're doing for ESG. So clearly there is a drive from sort of large shareholders within these organizations to get these firms to actually, you know, step up and take some responsibility for, you know, the impact they have when you look at things like ESG. So I think it's, I, I do think, you know, internally, yes, there's, there's always that sort of, if I don't comply, I will get fined and that has the impact on my balance sheet. But I think more and more we're starting to see that the external kind of, um, 
the external drivers of reputational damage, you know, your shareholders, your investors, etc., asking you to get on board these, uh, you know, get on board with these initiatives is probably driving it more than uh, you would have expected. Um, you know, as uh, for, you know, I, I mean. I think it was clearly said away for Capco. Like for, for us as a firm, we're clearly seeing a lot of demand in the ESG space. Um, and that's, you know, and that's being driven because people don't have a clue about how to achieve it. They clearly realize that, you know, their participants or their clients are asking for this. Um, and they clearly realize that failure to do so and failure to do so in time is going to basically result in a reduction in sort of throughput and, th and flow for these organizations. So I think it's it's weirdly it is you know internally if you don't comply you'll get fined but externally if you don't comply the, ch the chances are you won't be around to you know suffer the internal consequence in the long run. No, that, that, that's a fantastic answer, and it might be something I, I don't know if Ian, Paul, or Suzanne want to you know add your angle to as well. Um, you know, from my side personally, you know, I'm 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 going back to the SMCR piece and the responsibility and more people accountable sticking their arms up or hand, <laughs> hands free, but. Uh, and being accountable. That's something I've seen in my time, both technology and consultancy side, is the lack of, you know, lack of responsibility, either being dished to people or people actually, you know, hiding behind controls and not taking responsibility for them. Um, you know, so that SMCR piece is an internal compliance um, issue. But, I, you know, I haven't seen that much self-motivation is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I've seen I the opposite. Uh, I think it's interestingly, you know, that the question comes from the Netherlands where bankers make an oath, you know, in terms of, in terms of their conduct. Uh, and, you know, to Sonia's point, I think this creating the right, the right culture with the right controls that, that engenders the right conduct is, is really important. And I, I agree with Drew, but I think that people have got really good now at working out whether companies are authentic in terms of whether they're actually living what they're doing or whether they're just getting away with it. Uh, and I think increasingly um, that will be where the distinction will be. Are you just getting away with it or are you really living it? Yeah. And, and to that point, actually, you know, I'm glad Mark's accepted the, and registered because he's good with his questions. But he was saying, you know, does, you know, does reputational damage really impact that much? Obviously, you've got the Credit Suisse scandal at the minute. You've got Westpac. You've got um, obviously Archipelago. I can never pronounce that. <laughs> scandal as well. well I, I think, I think interesting. Do you think? Yeah, I think interesting. Sorry to speak over you, Lee. That's oh, right. But in, interestingly, you know, Paul, you mentioned that um, background in the tobacco industry. Well, you know, there's an industry who, whose reputation um, had to be managed and, and is still being yeah. managed and had all kinds, you know, and, you know, what could be, um, you know, what could be finance's cigarette moment, you know, or you might argue we've already had that <laughs> and we've had it a few times, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Please. Sorry, just to add, talk about the ESG. So, you know, for non-financial companies, particularly manufacturing companies, they're marketing directly to, con to the consumer. So they they now talk about the consumer and society is more important than their shareholders because they can see if they're not doing the right thing. With, because it's known, I mean, when I was at school, and that was a long time ago, you smoked, it was bad for you. So well, no one could claim otherwise. At otherwise. school in the class. <laughs> yes, right. so, so, so people always know so they've always managed their reputation and all of the legal cases but they're very you know with a new product so you've got the old cigarettes and cigars but even with the new product so these things are supposed to be reduced you know harm devices so either you know the vaping where you get the, the nicotine's dissolved in a fluid and you inhale there's the steam and things like that or where they heat the tobacco but you don't burn it so they thought they were going great guns. And then you had Juul in the US was a quick startup, was worth a huge sum of money in a very short time. And then all of a sudden you had these kids in America dying because certain American manufacturers were putting too much nicotine in the product compared to the others. And these teenagers, because it was coming out with flavors like, not tobacco flavor, it's watermelon. Cherry. Cherry. I have to buy it for my other half down the so, local so shop. <laughs> so, so these, and they, they've got... There's like one of those little, to give you a perspective, one of those little vials that you have that you use for your vaping tool has as much nicotine in, in, in a, as a packet of cigarettes. And these kids were having three or four of these every day. Just and right they were now. suffering nicotine poisoning. So all of a sudden you've got that coming in and all of a sudden the new products from the tobacco companies were deemed to be very bad and the government were focusing on them. They were talking about tax. So, you know, coming from that side, 
there's always a constant review of social media, you know, about what are the consumers saying about the product. It's, it's quite telling. So they're more interested in appeasing society and the consumers than necessarily the shareholders, because ultimately, if you don't address how society views you correctly, your profits are going to tumble anyway. Outside of FS, companies are even more aware of the ESG agenda, but very much around society's expectations more and more every single day than traditionally would have been. Yeah, yeah and I think it's quite interesting, you know, just to build on that, for, and we've got a few minutes left now, um, but in terms of, I think Mark's point might be that in manufacturing, that tends to impact, you know, that's why they probably focus on the customers as well. But are we seeing the same in, you know, like Credit Suisse's and, and the Westpac or, you know, the, the, the loads that have happened before? Are they really seeing any impact in, in their customer base or, you know, are the customer base educated enough to start picking up on this? I think ESG, yes, Ian, I would have think so. They're starting yeah. to be. But with but the financial think... um, uh, stories that have happened before, most people probably don't read them and they, they just can't be bothered moving banks and all that kind of aspects as well. Do you think that's changing to the panel? I, 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 think, I think it's very significant, the change that's been committed to because it's actually at a supranational level, um, decisions have been made to say we can affect change most effectively through um, the financial services sector. So by the way in which you deploy your balance sheets, where money gets lent, how money yeah. gets managed, you know, and that's that's really where the UN and there's a lot of collective thought gone behind this. This is not a this is not a you know a five minute exercise. It was basically said that is where we will drive change most effectively by deciding where economic resources get allocated going forward. But we are not selling that and re the response no. to that as a regulatory impetus. We're no. selling it as an organizational impetus. We want to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I meant by internal versus external. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I completely agree with that, um, Sonia. I, I think it, you know, the, the, the test will be just how authentic it is, you know, because people will yeah. see through it. So there's a lot of there's a lot of conversation at the moment around greenwashing. There's a lot of people about conversation around, you know, are are, are the base calculations really, you know, the, the cost of a uh, of the carbon set off is, is is that really detailed enough and so on. Um, I I think at one level um, there's going to be huge amounts of debate around that, and no doubt there'll be fortunes made and lost and so on. Um, but the great thing is it's it's centre stage, it's front and centre right now. It's being talked about, and there isn't a firm out there which isn't thinking about how it does exactly. good as opposed to doing harm. And the first part of the change that that was required was really to say we're in a hole, let's stop digging. And then the yes. next part is well, tell us what measures you can take to start improving that. And the third part is show us how you're going to measure uh, those, those changes. You know, that's really what the, the, the regulation is going to boil down to. Um, and I almost look at that and I think, well, we've been here before, haven't we? You know, those, those, are, the, those are, you know, sort of classic regulatory frameworks. You know, where, where are we now? What are you doing? What are you going to do differently and how are you going to measure it? You know, a lot and of it comes with operational resilience. I was just speaking over you to get back at you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, apologies for speaking over you. But no, you know, with Operation Resilience and SMCR and the GDPR a few years ago, all, all that kind of stuff, right? And the others yeah. coming down the line. Um, and we've literally, we've got a minute to seven, so we, we can wrap it up now. Um, I think two questions that have come in, which I, which I might have missed actually, but um, I'll, I'll collate any other questions that have come in to like a follow-up bit of content and then post that on, on the website. And I didn't mention at the start, but it is Chatterman's rule. But um, I'm hoping that at the end of this, because um, I'll, I'll speak to all the speakers, everyone that spoke, and Mark, um, I don't usually uh, you know, include any of the questions, and I'll edit it down, and it will be um, sent around the speakers to make sure they're okay with it before we're able to maybe pop it onto the website and, and uh, make it accessible for anyone that couldn't make it uh, due to um, competing diaries, etc. But um, is there any, anything that we didn't speak about that we'd like to mention before we wrap up? Suzanne, is there any closing comments? I'll go around, actually, if that's all right. Yeah, the thing I've been most struck by is it's really interesting to think about the stuff we think about every day, but in a different context. So, you know, the issues that financial services faces from an ops risk and, and compliance perspective are 
sometimes quite unique, but but really at base they're no different than than manufacturing or which is sort of figuring out the best way to get it right in a tight cost environment with yeah. lots of resource pressure. So I have found this really useful. Thank you. No, thank you for joining. And Sonia, any closing closing comments or summaries? For, well, for me, the takeaway, again, is just the value of the connections we make. You know, we get the value from understanding which regs are similar. We get the value from understanding how do we connect with different people in a different organization to deliver. And, um, you know, so this was, uh, and, and I actually think your tree works with the, with the roots. I just wanted to tell you your. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're the first one to mention that. No one commented on my Buddhist kind of approach to as above, so, so below. So thank, you. thank you for that. Uh, what about, um, Drew's on mute, so I'll, I'll go to Ian for a closing comment. Or yeah, I, I, I would just reiterate, I think the, the, the sort of usefulness of the framework that we have, which which you know is is almost second nature, and, and can sometimes be seen as um, a little bit of an imposition. Uh, I think you know to Suzanne's point, we can make a a, a real um, virtue of the fact that we're actually good at doing this stuff, and uh, you know it can it can be a it can be a source for collaboration because there'll be lots of recognition points as well between firms and across firms, uh, and you know that this is I think something we can rejoice in. I think, and that, that's a good word to use, actually, because, you know, risk and compliance or, you know, operational risk, you know, it's never been that, you know, kind of a, a sexy kind of <laughs> terminology or, you know, it's not been looked at positively within firms is what I'm trying to say. Right. Even yeah, to Paul's yeah. point around, you know, internal audit, external audit, it's always been seen with a negative connotation. And I think that's always needed to change. And it, it's starting to change now um, because more education I think, is happening internally back to my wheel that's down there. Which I'll send you a pic. I'll send a picture. I'll put it on the website. But uh, but thanks, Ian. And then Paul, is there any any summary points or final comments from yourself? No, I must. Admit, I thought it was a really good session. Actually, I've learned a lot around financial services coming from a low base, and I did feel it put a lot more sort of apples on your tree of life, so to speak. Oh, so, oh I like that. Thank you for that. Even more side of you in the future. Well, oh, yeah. apple the side. I didn't even make that connection. I was going to say the next batch in October. If anyone wants one, ping me and I'll, I'll send one in the post. It's a bit. It's not too bad. It's, it's got, you know, I've got the bubbles in it, so it's all right. But no, that's that's a good one. You know, this the strength of the roots shows how far you grow, or something like that. Is I came up with the other week, but uh, we'll move on quickly. Drew, final comments. Thank you, Paul. No, Drew, no. Any final comments? No, to be honest, nothing over what's already been said. I think it was a really good session and good to hear from, I guess, all the uh, panelists and speakers, and to see sort of how it. To be honest, how it's all sort of interconnected, irrespective of financial services or not, it's all got the same kind of challenges. A bit like roots of a tree, right? A like Just a exactly <laughs> like that, Lee. Surprising. <laughs> But no, I, I want to just summarise now, because I know we've gone a few minutes over it, just to thank all of you for, you know, sparing your, your precious time to attend the people that are registered and attended, but also the speakers as well, who, again, I'll mention, gave up some time this week and last week to align on calls to, to make sure that, you know, the topic made sense <laughs> to Joan's point when uh, she questioned me at the start. So that's fine. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversations. Like I mentioned, there will be an edited, the smaller version that will be green lighted by everyone and we'll make it um, available in a week or so. Um, and if you did like it, please tell everybody, your family, anyone you can. If you didn't, just please keep it quiet. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. But uh, we'll hopefully see you at live events. This is hopefully the, the final virtual, um, the virtual session. We may do some in between live events, but I really want to get back to the magic of the live events in London. Hopefully do a, a follow up in um, Edinburgh because we had a really good session in Edinburgh in October 2019. I'd love to start one in Manchester and then Dublin and then we're going to you know, go global. So uh, hopefully you'll all stay involved and pass the word on. So thank you all. Have a great evening and speak to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. 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 A big thank you to our co-sponsors for tonight's event. That's ASIN and CAPCO. Also, a big thank you to the Women in Risk and Control, who this is in association with, and the RegTech Forum, for helping us with speakers and for content for the session as well.